Good morning, everyone. It's very nice to see you all here. Welcome to the inaugural last Thursday of the month, Coffee Chat with Guilford College. My name is Ara Sergiui, and I have the pleasure and privilege of serving as the Vice President for Advancement at Guilford College. Uh, this morning, I am joined by my esteemed colleague, Professor Tim Kircher. Uh, Tim is the Kurt and Pat Heggie Professor of History at Guilford College. He has taught here for 31 years. He has a PhD in history from Yale University that he earned in 1989. And Tim's research has fo focused on Renaissance history, including the responses to the Black Death of 1348. Welcome, Tim. Welcome. Uh, thank you, Ara. It's great to be here. Thank you. I'm very glad that you are the first uh, featured speaker for our coffee chat with Guilford College. Uh, so, Tim, um, this crisis has just uh, taken us all by surprise. And uh, I remember speaking to my mother, who lives in Tehran, back in January, and um, and kind of very worried about what was happening globally and the effect of it that was uh, quickly spreading to other parts of the world and giving her all these uh, thoughts about how she should protect herself. But here in the United States in January, we were kind of a little oblivious to what might be coming our way. And, uh, and then all of a sudden um, in March, uh, President Fernandez uh, formed an emergency task force to deal with COVID-19. Um, and, and as the rest of you know, um, you know, everything just evolved so quickly after that. Uh, so Tim, can you tell uh, us if the world has been through um, something like this before? Well, yes, the short answer is absolutely. As a matter of fact, uh, if we look at the course of most of, rec of recorded history, it's, it's rare when there hasn't been a type of epidemic or pandemic affecting people's lives. Um, the so-called first pandemic of plague, um, historians uh, go back to the sixth century of our era BCE, but there were outbreaks of plague and epi uh, epidemic disease even before that, um, all the way you know, going back thousands of years. So it's rare, I think, when we uh, when we don't have a type of epidemic or pandemic somewhere on the globe, even if uh, there are times, of course, when we feel relatively secure and isolated from the effects of these diseases. Well, thank you. That's interesting that you say that, you know, this has happened before and uh, perhaps many times, and it's rare that, in fact, if something like this is not happening. So can you tell us a little bit about perhaps what some of the most prominent uh, pandemics have been in the history of humanity? Sure. Uh, well, uh, the, there are the, the first, I mentioned the first pandemic, which is the outbreak of, uh, we think, bubonic plague in the sixth century. The second pandemic is the one that I've done the most uh, research about. And that began, as you mentioned, 1348, 1347, maybe 1346, anyway, in the, in the mid uh, 14th century and lasted um, with great repetition all the way into the 18th century, at least in, on the European continent. Um, there was a third outbreak of plague in the 19th century, and these are just outbreaks of bubonic plague <clears throat> in terms of other diseases, cholera, smallpox, malaria. Um, these are diseases that in some, some of them like smallpox, um, I think the WHO, the World Health Organization, is celebrating the 40th anniversary of the eradication of smallpox this year. So um, going back to 1980, but malaria and cholera are still obviously devastating diseases in many areas of the world. Um, so those are just a few. HIV AIDS, of course, is another one that we're all familiar with um, that would be considered another pandemic. So there are many, many, I think, diseases that we don't necessarily apply the name pandemic to, but we're, we're very much familiar with. Uh, some historians will call tuberculosis a type of epidemic and pandemic, and that's, of course, still very much with us and still devastating. I think there were 1.7 million people died of tuberculosis a couple years ago in the world, so it's a, it's a devastating disease. <clears throat> 
So the history of global health crises, um, whether a pandemic or epidemic, some other form really dates back uh, several centuries, uh, at least in recorded history. Um, so based on your research and your knowledge, uh, what made each of these uh, health crises unique in terms mm -hmm. of their effects and, and human response to them? Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a great question. It's, it's, it gets to the heart of history um, because uh, we can see how different societies uh, responded to disease. And we could try to draw analogies, right? Which is what we're all trying to do today. We're trying to look at the past and draw analogies to our situation in the present. Uh, so if we, so every, every response is then dependent on what I like to call governing knowledge. And what I mean by governing knowledge, it, it isn't just the knowledge of the political class or the authorities of the time. They could be religious authorities, they could be political authorities but it's the type of knowledge that people possess in, the, in response to disease and what they understand it to be, what its origin is. And we go to the 14th century, which you mentioned, which was my area of research. There are many different explanations for the outbreak of plague from a type of miasma, bad air, to uh, astrological conjunctions. There's, there's a lot of astrological theory that said this was an alignment of certain planets. Uh, there was some interpretation of that it was uh, a type of punishment for sin, though I found in my own research that's less prevalent than we might believe, actually, at least with the initial outbreak. There were accusations of scape, there were incidents uh, of scapegoating, uh, accusations against uh, minority people uh, for creating the outbreak through poison and ill will towards the majority population. So. We have uh, a number of incidents of that uh, occurring throughout the initial outbreaks of plague and beyond. So every, every society is different and it depends then upon what kind of preconceptions, cultural, intellectual, spiritual preconceptions that society has. Okay. I could say more, but I'm just, I'm just closing it here. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you for doing that. So let's, let's talk about the Black Death. Um, okay. Where did that originate and how did it become a global health crisis? Right. So <clears throat> we know this is what's, again, fascinating about the Black Death is we have an idea of what it is now, though, uh, in terms of its epidemiology and uh, its, uh, its actual, what we would call its scientific nature. But that um, was only identified in the 19th century through a Russian scientist named Yurtsin. So the bacterium that uh, causes the plague is named after him. <laughs> uh, but in the 14th century, of course, they didn't have an understanding of bacterial transmission of disease. It came from Asia, uh, we think, from the Middle East and Asia uh, into Europe on merchant ships. So it's arrived in the port cities uh, like Genoa and Marseille, and it then traveled north. And <clears throat> one of the frightening aspects of the Black Death is because people didn't know, uh, again, the governing knowledge wasn't there to know the bacterial nature of the disease. They really didn't know why it was affecting them, but they could see it coming. So it came with seasonal frequency and traveled north throughout Europe. And uh, so people who weren't caught in the first wave, let's say of 1347, um, could see it in nearby towns and villages, and they could take certain actions that we might be familiar with. They could try to quarantine themselves. Often that was very difficult to do. And so it arrived in the cities usually, uh, it, it broke out in the cities usually in the spring and lasted until the fall. It was a, that type of dis, uh, seasonal disease and it, we have to try to get our minds around this. And my students often read accounts of, of the first outbreak of plague and different, different narratives. But you have to imagine half of a city perishing in the space of four months, which is, I think, for us, mind boggling. Um, but it was a completely devastating for towns uh, that didn't recover their population until probably well into the 18th century. Great. Thank you. So when you when you were talking about the where where it started and how it started to spread, it certainly struck a, a chord with me in terms of the similarity of what we're dealing with mm -hmm. now. Yes. And so 
Can you talk a little bit, Tim, about uh, perhaps the similarities in terms of these world health crises? What 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 makes them similar, and how how is that sim how is that knowledge perhaps helping us in understanding um, what to do now? Right. Yes. Well, I I like to talk to my students about history not being simply secular but more spiral. In other words, that there are analogies we can draw even as our times have changed from the past. And so when we're talking about a disease like the plague, the Black Death, um, in comparison to, uh, say, COVID or, or the coronavirus, one of the similarities is that it's often transmitted, it was largely transmitted along trade routes. Uh, and so it was, tra it, it was transported by people. So that's the, the similarity that we've been struggling with today, right, is how do we control our own, what we call social distancing, um, how much we travel uh, in terms of in interacting with people outside our, our houses, what kind of uh, transportation we should we have, should we be allowed to travel from state to state, from country to country, do we close down borders, um, these were all the same issues that authorities in Europe were facing in the 14th, 15th, 16th, 17th century, I mean, going, going on for centuries. And in the case of the first outbreak of plague in 1348, a city like Milan was able to see it coming because it's in the northern part of Italy, as we know. And so it was able to anticipate the arrival of the plague and it actually quarantined itself effectively against that first outbreak as one of the few areas in Europe that was spared because it was able to enforce a type of citywide um, lockdown, if you will. Uh, it wasn't so fortunate later uh, with other outbreaks of plague. Port cities uh, like Venice, Genoa, uh, Ragusa, or Dubrovnik today, uh, created what they called uh, plague camps so that any uh, ship arriving to that city would have to quarantine itself. Of course, our word quarantine comes from those early efforts to isolate people for up to 40 days before they could enter the city to make sure that they were free from contagion um, or in, in infection as they entered the city. So you had that type of um, mechanism built into place. Often it was overwhelmed um, by the number of people trying to arrive. It was devastating for the people who were in quarantine if they had the plague, as we also witnessed for with cruise ships, for example, today. But a lot of these uh, efforts to restrict the movement of people, let's say, were very important then as they are, as authorities feel they are now, in order to um, control the spread of disease. Now, this does not apply to diseases, I think, like malaria or cholera, which have other um, routes of transmission. But just comparing the coronavirus to the plague, I think it applies. You mentioned Milan and that uh, in the first wave of the plague, Milan planned in a way that really minimized mm -hmm. uh, the adverse effects of, uh, of the uh, situation, but that it wasn't quite as fortunate uh, the next time around. Uh, what do you mean by that? Well, it was situa again, situations change, right? And, and that re relates to how, what kind of political and civil authorities are in place, how they can anticipate the arrival of disease, whether or not the population heeds um, the advice of the authorities, trusts in them, right? These are all dynamic political, social, cultural issues. And um, as in the history of really any place in the world, right? The history of Milan changes over time. And in later outbreaks of the plague, for example, in the 17th century, is the, is there's another very, let us say, famous outbreak because it was recorded in one of the great works of Italian literature, Manzoni's The Betrothed. Um, he was writing in the 19th century, but he did a lot of research on 17th century Milan. Um, the city was in the middle of the Thirty Years' War, uh, which, which afflicted Europe from 1618 to 1648, and it was brought into the city by German mercenary troops. So a very different situation than uh, obtained for Milan in the 14th century. So, um, and so this was, this was true in other places in Europe too. Venice uh, was able to resist certain outbreaks of plague, and then in other times it was absolutely devastated by it, depending on the strength 
of the civil authorities and the religious authorities and the, the, the nature of the history of the time. Thank you. So the human response, uh, even in the same part, in the same part of the world, in the same city, changed drastically. And as a result, the effect of the plague was very different. Uh, and it uh, reminds me of an article I read about how uh, the city of Butte, Montana, reacted to the influenza um, spread. And uh, because of the concerns they had about the adverse effect of closing it down and how it would, um, how it would really destroy their economy, um, they didn't really do anything about it at first. And ultimately, it ended up uh, killing a lot of people and, and nearly destroying uh, the economy of Butte, Montana. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, let's kind of, I guess, with that, uh, jump fast forward a little bit uh, to the 1918-1919 uh, influenza right. uh, epidemic. What can you tell us about that and the effect of it? Um, how, how did, where did it start and how did it spread? Well, that's uh, another, if I can use the word very interesting or fascinating pandemic. I, I hate to use that adjective, but it, it is very interesting. The, some scholars like um, Christian McMillan uh, has asserted, and, and you know, he's far more knowledgeable about this than I am, of course, that it started probably in an army camp in Kansas. So we have to associate that outbreak of influenza with World War I uh, and, and countries at war and all the social and um, um, demographic challenges and, de and catastrophes that war imposes on people. So there were two outbreaks of that influenza, I think generally understood. There was a first outbreak that was milder <clears throat> that afflicted people earlier in 1918. Um, and some historians say it effectively immunized certain places from the second more devastating outbreak, which you know, another nature of uh, viral changes. But the city of Copenhagen, for example, was able to resist the second outbreak <clears throat> much, uh, much better than other places because it had a, uh, was largely affected by the first outbreak. But then the second outbreak occurred uh, later on in 1918. And it, uh, we don't know exactly where it took root, but probably we think in army camps in France, perhaps England, and that's, that's why it's often called the Spanish flu, because Spain was neutral, so they decided to name it after the country that probably wasn't responsible for it. That also often happens with the way people name diseases. So it arrived then in the United States, probably through the transport of troops, and it, it afflicted Boston and Philadelphia terribly, and then it, of course, came to North Carolina, and many of our listeners will know about its its presence in North Carolina, and it and in its consequences for Guilford College, because Guilford College was um, about 170 students at the time. It was in a period of great change. The uh, Raymond Binford had just become president of Guilford College in earlier in 1918, and the college had about 170 students. And if we can imagine that um, a college of 170 students and 70 of those students got the flu. Now, to add to that, this second wave of flu was particularly vir um, uh, virulent and, and lethal for people of a college age, what we call traditional college age. It, it killed vast numbers of people between ages of 20 and 40, people that we don't think as being immunologically compromised in any way, but this was the nature of that, of that influenza. Um, but Guilford responded. Uh, it quarantined those students who had the flu, um, many of them in what we now uh, call Haiti Cox uh, Hall, and not a single student died. Um, and so it survived, the, it survived the flu very well, but it certainly left its mark on the campus. Um, a Guilford College graduate uh, named Laura Worth returned to campus as a nurse, and she tended to these students. And, um, and then afterwards, the, 
Raymond Binford carried on, uh, the college was in a financial crisis and he had to carry on uh, with the college through that period and on to a, a period of very intense fundraising and successful fundraising for the college. Yes, thank you for sharing that. It's interesting that um, based on what we know, about a third of the world's population was infected with uh, influenza back in 1918, 1919. And so about that's 500 million people and uh, the death estimate ranges anything from 20 million to 50 million. Right. And so um, it's, it's interesting and really a good thing that Guilford College uh, reacted in a way that while about half of the population of the students did get infected, that we didn't lose anybody as a result right. of the flu. Um, we've talked about some of the similarities between these world health crises. Um, what do you know, what can you tell us about differences between uh, these different health crises and responses to them? Yes, well, uh, to state, I think, a, a point that <clears throat> I think many of our, many people here will, will, stri will strike many people as obvious, but I think needs to be said, is that we now, um, turn to laboratory scientists and have been for over a hundred years in trying to understand the nature of disease. So um, Christian McMillan talks about a laboratory era that we're in, in the 20th and 21st centuries. So we can start talking about vaccines. We know about viruses um, and, and things that are almost common parlance today that weren't known and, uh, to people before then. And so when we talk about a public health challenge today, we often first look to the scientists, right, for answers. And much of the reporting in the news, uh, including yesterday's news, was about um, antiviral therapies, about vaccines. Um, the scientists are explaining to us exactly why we should keep six feet or more apart from one another, why we should stay in place that, because we have a much clearer understanding about how viruses spread, how they're transmitted, and the different ways that they're transmitted. We're still learning, but we, we are subjecting those all to a type of laboratory and scientific scrutiny. And this type of scientific establishment didn't exist, um, or wasn't well established before the 20th century, let's say. It certainly existed, but it wasn't well established before the 20th century. I think the other major difference is the idea of international organizations. That the first international health organization started in the 19th century in response to the cholera outbreak. And now, again, we are often talking in, in the news today about the World Health Organization, which was founded in 1948. And that organization is, is designed to really confront world health challenges, including, and, but not exclusively by any means, but certainly pandemics and epidemics. And so we have um, greater international cooperation and collaboration in contending with these outbreaks than we had also before the 20th century. So I think those are the two main differences I would, I would describe between sort of our present 20th, 21st century responses versus the responses earlier. I think Thank I can you. add, I suggest as I'm talking, more things are occurring to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, I, and I want to kind of ask a little bit more about that, actually. Yeah. So yes, I think you will end up adding more to it. <laughs> um, the, uh, earlier in the conversation, you spoke about, uh, again, going back to Milan and, and their response initially and then their second response and how there was a vast difference in terms of the impact right. of the plague on that city because of the responses. Uh, what is there in the history to tell us about um, how information was being shared that perhaps had an effect, therefore, on people's responses to these health crises. Was there, was there what, what can you tell us about um, accurate information sharing, misinformation, a, a, def, a deliberate effort perhaps to, uh, to confuse people or to give them wrong information? What can you tell us about that? Again, that's a, that's a constant, uh, though, of course, it varies uh, over, over in history according to the means of communication. Um, so all of the above, right, were, was going on. Uh, in Milan in the 17th century, I go back to the 1630 outbreak, the, um, 
the authorities, and I wanted to be careful about this, these were both civic as well as religious authorities. And I, I think we, we, we have to talk not simply about, as we do today, about uh, government, uh, secular government figures, but, but also about religious authorities. They were warning people about the dangers of the epidemic, but they weren't believed. Uh, and so this is a, and this is, this is um, something that we're, we're still contending with today. It's true in almost every outbreak of epidemic or pandemic. Um, and as a result, uh, the disease spread because the people at the time thought that the, the political authority had been challenged because of the ongoing war and the turmoil and the divisions within the city. And that had, that had devastating um, results. And so going back to this term governing knowledge, it's not just the knowledge of, so to speak, what we would call the government, but it's also the knowledge that people possess in all levels of society, what governs their actions and how they then respond to people that they perceive to be in authority. Do they actually believe the scientists? Do they actually believe the government? Um, do they actually believe the religious leaders when they're told um, about the nature of, a, of widespread epidemics? And this relates also to um, the, the, the issue or problem with vaccines. So uh, in, even if, we, if a, a vaccine has been developed in, in, in the past, it's not clear that people in towns and villages, for example, will take it if they don't trust the people administering the vaccine, right? That they see that this is actually something that will be eff um, efficacious. So those are also challenges that people in, I, I like to say public health, we're all in public health. We are all publicly uh, attuned to health, but people who are in the public health, let's say establishment, need to confront. If I could just say one more example, which I think is really fascinating, and that's the Ebola outbreak in Africa. And there, that's often seen as a failure of the World Health Organization because it didn't respond quickly to it. So what group did? It's the group that we now call Doctors Without Borders, right? They went into Africa and they treated people with Ebola and they were giving reports back to the World Health Organization saying, this is devastating. But people in Geneva weren't quite getting it. They weren't quite grasping the, the, the dimensions of the outbreak. So um, every group that's uh, been in charge of uh, addressing, let us say, public health crises, right, has this issue of their authority and whether their authority is to be trusted and whether their advice is to be followed. Thank you. Thank you. It's interesting to see the constants in terms of um, political response, religious response, um, mm -hmm. um, health professionals response. Mm -hmm. I'm curious to hear from you about um, artistic response. What can you tell us about the artistic response to prior health crises? And, um, and what examples of that exist now? So for example, I follow uh, Humans of New York on social media. Right. Founder of that, Brandon Stanton, two years ago was one of our featured speakers as part of the uh, very uh, esteemed Brian series uh, program. And so he has been doing these quarantine stories now uh, and sharing people's stories uh, that, that he's able to capture um, as a result of kind of this lockdown. So to me, that's a wonderful and very relevant uh, artistic way of uh, connecting people. Right. Uh, through this uh, situation. Uh, right. What can you tell us about the past? How have, how have the arts played a role in responding to health crises in the past? Yes, uh, well, thanks. That's a, it's a very, it's an endless, uh, there, there's an endless answer, but I'll give a few examples that I use in, one I use in my class, I've used it in my class last week. Um, and that's, uh, there's a famous description of the outbreak of plague in Florence in 1348. And it was written by the Florentine um, poet, writer, humanist named Giovanni Boccaccio in the introduction to his most famous work, which is called the Decameron. And this work was, has been influential in world literature, including um, uh, borrowings by Chaucer and Shakespeare and so on. Well, Boccaccio begins the work by discussing 
uh, he says firsthand how the plague affected Florence. It's one of the most famous descriptions that we have. It has the appearance of being real and true, and yet it's also very artistic. It's something that's very carefully designed. And I gave it to my students last week uh, in my Renaissance class, and many of them responded, it resonated with them in terms of what they were feeling going through with their isolation and the feeling of dislocation and fragmentation. What I think pandemics do is a sense they fragment society, they create closures and distancing, we call it distancing. And then the challenge for us, I think all of us is to foster a sense, the greater sense of openness. And that's what art can do. Uh, so Boccaccio is telling us about this devastating outbreak of plague in, in Florence in 1348 in order, it's an act, uh, as he says, the very first sentence of the work, it's a very famous sentence. It's a sentence that guides me and my, uh, my own responses to things like this. It's, it's a very human quality to have compassion for those in distress, right? I think of this also as a Quaker value. And so he engages in a type of what we now what I call narrative medicine. I think narrative medicine is very powerful medicine. It's not, again, a laboratory, it's not a laboratory medicine. It's not something you might find in a, immediately in a doctor's office, though doctors are increasingly being trained in narrative medicine, which means listening to people's stories. What are they saying? What are they experiencing? Now, it doesn't have to be COVID. It doesn't have to be coronavirus. It could be anything they come into the, your, the office about. And so this practice of narrative medicine, um, whether it's coronavirus, whether it's COVID stories um, about isolation and quarantine, whether it's about um, people suffering plague in the 14th century, these are very important responses that can offer a sense of healing and wholeness and unity um, because in the course of Boccaccio's work, it's there are 10 young Florentines who tell themselves each day with structure, rhythm, pattern, 10 stories. So over 10 days, they tell 100 stories, right? And this type of exchange of communication, of openness, is uh, seen as a healing process as they're, apart, they're away from Florence for two weeks, and then they, at the end of the book, they would go back to Florence. Um, so that's, just a, that's a literary response. Um, if, I mean, there's so many responses to talk about. Another, of course, is let's go to the world of visual arts and painting would be um, the veneration, let's say, of saints. Um, there are th three or four very famous plague saints that have inspired artists throughout the centuries in, in Europe. Saint Sebastian, Saint uh, Roch, as he's called in French, or San Rocco in Italian. And then there are, there's a lo there are also local saints like Santa Rosalia, Saint Rosalie in Sicily. And these have inspired, inspired artists um, over the centuries. So if you've been to Venice and you go to the Franciscan church uh, the, called the Santa Maria dei Frari and you go behind the Franciscan church to the Scuola Grande di San Rocco, the great school of Saint Roch. And in that building, now this was a, what you call a confraternity, which means it was, there were lay people. These were not clerics but they were a charitable organization dedicated to the help of other people. And they, uh, obviously because their patron saint was Saint Roch, they were dedicated also to people who suffer disease and uh, um, epi uh, epidemic and so on, because Saint Roch was a plague saint. In that building, it's covered floor to ceiling by paintings by Tintoretto, the Venetian master Tintoretto. Um, it's one of the great works of art. Um, Van Dyck, Anthony Van Dyck, had the fortune or misfortune to visit Sicily in, in the early 17th century, go to Palermo when there was an outbreak of plague and he was quarantined. So what does he do? He paints four or five uh, paintings of Santa Rosalia. So we have these paintings by Van Dyck as a way, not just to express himself artistically, but as a way of recognizing the power, the healing power as people saw it, of this spiritual figure. Can Thank I, you, Tim. Yeah, there's more. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. And I, I yeah. want to expand on that a little bit yeah. because yeah. I'm curious as to how much have, um, how much have the literary, art, literary arts and visual arts captured 
for us all these centuries later a better understanding of what really happened as a result of those health crises. I think they do very powerfully, and especially at a moment like today, when we are undergoing our health crisis. I think it can be very comforting to have that communication with the past and to understand that <clears throat> we're all historical beings. I like to tell my students, we're not just rational animals, but we're historical beings. We all exist with a past and a present and a future. And so we can time travel in history and go back to past um, societies and look at what they did in response to crisis and learn from them, learn from their successes, learn from their failures. But it's important um, to notice the differences between ourselves and, and past societies, but also to notice the continuities. And if I might just add one more example from the visual arts that's been on my mind this last week, and that's architecture. So interesting for us to think about to what degree is space an element of healing or health. We can obviously think of gardens as healing spaces and nature as healing spaces. But when I think of um, architecture, I think also of the votive church in, uh, there's two votive, major votive churches in Venice. Um, the one that's in my mind now is a church built after the 1575 outbreak of plague called the Redeemer Church, the Chiesa del Redentore, by Andrea Palladio. Andrea Palladio is one of the famous architects in history. And he adapted Roman architecture for his day in 16th century Venice. And he inspired other architects like the great Islamic architect Sinan. So Sinan worked in developing spaces in mosques. Uh, Palladio developed spaces in churches that were healing in the sense is that they provided a sense of tranquility, serenity, uh, and that can't be underestimated. And if I could just add this final thought is, um, I discovered recently there was a professor at the University of Pennsylvania named Chatterjee, whose work is actually in the field of neuroesthetics. And this is what he examines is how spaces affect the mind and how they can add in, uh, aid in healing. So I think even though we now again have a laboratory scientific discipline to study this phenomenon, it was understood by people in the past. Thank you. Um, you mentioned earlier that um, you have been engaging your students in, mm -hmm. uh, in a study of the historical effects and the um, and, um, impact of prior health crises. And, um, I'm curious to hear from you if you have any of your students' stories to share. As a, as a side, I want to share with our audience that I became uh, exposed to some of these stories as a result of the Guilford Emergency Fund that right. we established in response to COVID-19. And we had this incredible outpouring of philanthropic support by members of the Guilford College community, our alums, benefactors, parents, uh, who contributed to it. Uh, students needed housing and people in the local community, including one of our trustees, provided housing for students that had to move out um, of their residence halls. Um, and so, and the students started to apply for this emergency fund immediately. As soon as we announced it, we had, I think about three or 400 students applied asking for support. Um, and, um, so just really touching stories that I got to read. Right. What have you heard from our students in terms of the impact of this on them, whether yeah. financially or emotionally? Yeah, yes. Well, uh, one, there's a number of stories. One story is a student, uh, when we broke for spring break and we came back, <clears throat> I wasn't hearing from the student. And so I kept writing emails and not hearing from him. And finally, after two weeks, he wrote me and he said, I'm sorry, I've been out of touch. I went home, my father had the virus. I had to leave my house. Uh, he was under quarantine. I left, I went to live with my grandmother. My grandmother didn't have internet. My grandmother was, was you know, not, so to speak, on the, on the internet grid. And so I was unable 
to um, get in touch with you, to participate in the class. I mean, that's that's a, a simple but that, but dramatic uh, and telling story. There are other students who've gone home and have discovered that um, the dislocation uh, in terms of their work, and suddenly they found themselves needing to work a different job. So they were unable to attend class sessions. Uh, we had when we had synchronous real time class sessions because they were working. They had to. They, they may have had a job on campus at different times. They go home, they have to get another job. And so they're not able, right, to participate in class. And I think just on an emotional level, a number of students um, have told me uh, that they found that dislocation to be quite difficult in terms of their sense of the rhythm of learning. And it, this is apart from whatever, um, they may have great internet access they may you know that may not be an issue it's the issue is their engagement with other students and with the course when they do not have the rhythm of that physical environment the, the rhythm they find in a physical environment on campus right that's been a major adjustment for a number of them so uh it has it has affected students in different ways there's no it's created challenges for students in different ways Yes, thank you for sharing that. And I hope that we will be able to capture these stories and, um, and make sure that the future generations of Guildfordians will have an understanding of how uh, resilience manifested itself um, at Guildford College in response to this health crisis. Um, I want to um, kind of switch gears a little bit, if that's OK. Thank you for everything you've shared with us so far. Uh, professor Tim Kircher at Guilford College, uh, Curtin Pat Heggie, Professor of History. Uh, he has been sharing a lot of his knowledge and information and insights with us about history of health crises in the world. Um, and we're going to switch now a little bit uh, to ask you some questions that have been provided to us mm -hmm. by members of our audience. Um, Tim, I'd like to start with a question from Dan in Brown Summit, North Carolina. Uh, Dan asks, what kind of leadership resolved the health crisis, both in terms of scientific and political? Uh, you've touched on this a little bit. Maybe you can tell us a little bit more about what kind of leadership has resolved the health crises in the past. Um, and then maybe you can tell us a little bit about also about what's, what, what we have at Guilford College right now that can perhaps help us be a part of the solution. Right. We, yeah, that's a that's a it's a fascinating question. The whole question of historical leadership at any time, right? But particularly during moments of crisis <clears throat> and how they confront crises. Uh, and so, um, in in terms of the outbreak of the epidemic of the plague, for example, I've already mentioned the sort of the negative example, the failure of Milan to motivate its citizens in the 17th century, and I think. Um, the main, uh, if I go back to Venice, for example, I'm, I'm thinking out loud here, but what, what Venice did <clears throat> when it knew that it had to protect people from the plague, now we're really talking about what we might call palliative or supportive care for those afflicted, but it uh, sponsored the, the civic institutions uh, or civic slash religious institutions because they were often had blended uh, administrations to, first of all, provide a place to care for the sick. Uh, it also, I thought this was fascinating, that in, our, in the 15th century, they were trying to understand how the plague spread. And they thought, OK, it's not just spread by people, but it also might be spread by goods. OK, this, we can relate to that with coronavirus. So they found themselves, this was a, Venice was always a trading city, right? It was based on, on merchant uh, exchange. It had to destroy goods. It would quarantine not just people, but goods and destroy them. But it compensated. It felt, well, if I'm taking these goods away from you, I need to pay you for them. I'm going to compensate you for your loss of goods. I'm going to compensate you for your loss of work, right? And uh, try to, I, we understand that you're you know, very you know, badly hurt by this, but we're going to try to ease the pain of that event in your life. And that was one reason, I think, why the Venetian Republic was persisted for as long as it did all the way into the 18th century, because it, um, although it was 
a small group of people who ran the city, they had a sense of civic responsibility and civic obligation. And I think that that, that notion of obligation and responsibility is, is really critical in a moment of crisis. And um, to relate to what we're doing today, I, I think we see Guilford uh, res responding in those ways too, and, and the leadership at Guilford trying to, and making, conducting the outreach to all different constituencies and leading uh, forthrightly and, and talking um, with students and faculty staff about the choices, the hard choices that we're facing and um, what, uh, what kinds of plans, contingency plans, right? Because the future is unknown, what kind of plans we, we may have for the future. So um, I think that those are, that's really what uh, those, that exa those examples are what I would cite right now. There's, there, there are many, many others. There's many other ne negative examples about failures of leadership, but in terms of staying with the positive, I, I would say that. Great, thank you very much. Um, you and I were talking earlier about um, the response that the American Friends Service Committee had right. to the um, influenza epidemic. Yes. Yes. And um, I believe at uh, one point, Tim, you have been involved as a faculty member with the Center for Principal Problem Solving. Mm -hmm. um, what can you tell us in terms of those kind of endeavors at a place like Guilford College or in, or in society in general for bringing people from very different, perhaps, disciplines together to develop effective um, responses uh, to uh, crises in general? Yeah, I would, I would, that's a great question. And I would, I would talk about two qualities, Quaker qualities in, in particular. One is the, <clears throat> the idea of unity and the other is the idea of service. Uh, and what I think principal problem solving does for us today is it, it wants to bring, it does bring people of different backgrounds together to address issues that demand our attention in terms of service. And in 19, it's very much in the spirit of the, I think of the American Friends Services Committee because when it started in 1917, one of its first theaters of operation was in France. And if you go to their website, you can read the minutes, uh, the annual reports uh, going back to 1917 and they're absolutely fascinating. And I've had students uh, in my classes conduct research on, on the history of the AFSC. And what they did was they went to France and they built, and you see this in their, in their annual report, they built what they called tubercular houses. Well, what they mean by that, of course, are places for people who are suffering tuberculosis to convalesce. And so they were already, of course, attuned immediately to the public health emergencies in France, even before the war was over, and trying to get the help that society get back in some ways on its feet. And they were very keenly, uh, they very keenly attended to issues of sanitation, right? Which, which can inhibit or if not address spread disease. So we can see that notion, that history of service right there, uh, that's part of the Quaker mission. Of course, the FSC received the Nobel Peace Prize in 1947 uh, and so it's, it's a very long distinguished career, which I think has now a local habitation and a name, if I can use the phrase, in the principal problem solving um, area in Guilford College where people from all, walk, all parts of campus can come together, faculty, students, staff, and address issues that demand our attention in terms of service. Thank you. Um, Another one of our audience members, Emily in Charleston, South Carolina, uh, notes that the global and instantaneous nature of 21st century communications gives citizens of the world an enhanced capability of following the developments of this pandemic. To what extent do you think these advances in communication help or hinder our global response to the current situation? Yeah. Um. If I wanted to dodge the question, I would say both. <laughs> but I think I hope Emily would understand my my answer. Um, if I go back to this issue of op close and open and fragmentation and unity, right? Um, 
uh, certainly these means of commit for me in general i think this is a very positive of course positive development that we can become more globally connected right we can communicate with people all around over the world and i'm in touch as i'm sure many of you are and i know you are ara with people in other parts of the world you know finding out what's going on with your family or i have uh, family in england and friends in italy finding out what's going on in their lives and how they're contending with this crisis and i think that is the notion uh, that I, I i would emphasize of unity going back to that notion of unity and wholeness health to me is I, I tell my students is health is is related to wholeness and i was invited to give a talk to the to the um health sciences group in guilford last last semester where i would i address some of these themes and so we need to think of ourselves as a type of community uh, on many different levels uh and certainly on a campus and a college level but also beyond that to the to the world beyond and that we're all connected and so this this communication can foster that wholeness there's also a lot of misinformation right that's the other side of the coin that can tend to drive us apart that can that can lead us into different algorithmic bubbles as they're called right where we're only talking in these echo chambers of people who think like us and <clears throat> and so that's uh an issue that we need to contend with that we don't let the let us say the centrifugal forces right overcome the centripetal forces and that we need to keep attending to the center and think of health as wholeness um the the latin word solis which is often translated as health literally means wholeness it means well-being and the world health organization has it as its mission is to foster not just to contend with disease but to foster well-being i think that's a theme that we should we should very much keep in mind and in our hearts thank you tim um earlier in the conversation you talked about at different times um in in the history of humanity and with different health crises there being some resistance by people to uh, public health measures and and beliefs that were coming from different sectors, uh, health professionals, politicians, religious mm -hmm. leaders, and so on. Um, and so um, this question relates to that, and it will be the last question I'm going to ask you. It's from Deb in Vienna, Virginia, and she talks about whether the resistance that we saw in the previous, uh, previous circumstances uh, was it based on uh, people's kind of assertion of civil liberty? And was there any kind of resolution to the conflict? Mm -hmm. Right. Again, obviously it depends on the historical instance, right? That we're, we're looking at in terms of resolution. Um, notions of privacy and civil rights, right? Change over time. Um, and so it, it's it's there are differences of course between what we conceive to be civil liberties versus what people back then let's say i say back then i mean in the 14th 15th 16th century thought of as civil liberties um and the encroachment of say governmental authority or governmental power over their lives uh in terms of resistance i think one of the famous examples of resistance was not just during the disease, but also after the disease. <clears throat> and that's the, the resistance on the economic level and social level from workers who survived. And we see this today too, right? People who are engaged in um, um, essential, don't, you know, that's the word we're using, essential work, right? Are beginning to assert themselves when they feel that they're not properly protected, they're not properly compensated. Um, and this was uh we see this in a much more violent fashion in the 14th century when you think in simple economic terms with a shortage of labor right labor becomes more valuable and there were attempts then by landowners and governmental authorities to restrict wages to actually demand higher rents because their income had gone down and so there were violent outbreaks uh, and in, even in one case in Florence, the, the wool workers, uh, the wool industry was incredibly important in uh, Florence and other areas of Europe. 
they took over the city government. They, they rose up and they, it was called the Chompy Rebellion. The Chompy were the wool workers. They took over the city government for about a year. Um, there were outbreaks in, in France in the 1350s and uh, England in the 1380s. And these were all over, I don't know, we would call them civil liberties, but they were all over sort of a freedom of movement and a freedom to assert oneself in terms of the, the value of one's work. And in this case, the governmental authorities were trying to um, legislate, uh, if I can use that word, control wages of people who felt that their labor was worth more than, than the authorities said it was. And these were resolved with violence. I mean, that's, that's so they weren't resolved peacefully. Thank you. Uh, thank you for answering that question. Uh, what advice do you have for our audience based on everything you know about the history of um, global health crises and what we're experiencing now? What advice do you have for us? <clears throat> well, when I, when I was thinking about our conversation, and I want to thank you again for inviting me uh, and um, to speak and to talk with you really and to listen to other people's questions <clears throat> is, is this notion then of health and public health as something beyond, if I might use the word, medical knowledge, all right? And so I think when we talk today, often when we think of what public health is, we think of, okay, what again is the epidemiology of disease? Um, how can we develop uh, medicines and vaccines? This is incredibly important. I'm not trying to downplay that by any means, but I think public health is much larger than that. Public health also addresses the way people are living, right? What kind of access do they have to good food, clean water, um, spaces that are inducive to a feeling of well-being, uh, ability to exercise. I mean, all these things are, are features of, of, of public health. Um, discourse with one another, exchanges with one another. We all, we sometimes use the word toxic conversations, right? That's not necessarily uh, inappropriate, right? If we are fostering sort of a, a dis-ease among one another through the way we interact with each other. So I, uh, uh, Frank uh, Snowden <clears throat> has been in the news. He, he is a historian who wrote a book on epidemics, which was published last fall. So he's, uh, he's been interviewed in a number of venues. And one of the things he says, or quotes, I can't remember now, is that um, we should be changed. We should be changed by public health, by, by these pandemics. In other words, it, our normal may not have been so healthy. Right, so we need to think of ways in which when we, when in the, as we are coming out of the outbreak of the disease, right, that we can build, you know, more, a healthier place for us to inhabit with one another. And so the, the health, the public health, the Latin is salus publica, is really the public well-being. And that's what I would, that's what I've been thinking about. Thank you. That is excellent advice. It reminds me of a poem by the 13th century Persian poet Sadi, who said, human beings are members of a whole in creation of one essence and soul. If one member is afflicted with pain, other members uneasy will remain. If you have sympathy for human suffering, then you are worthy of the title human being. Mm. Uh, thank you, Tim. Uh, this has been a fantastic opportunity for us to hear from you. Thank you for sharing your expertise. Thank you to our audience members for joining us. As you can see, Guilford College continues to be after 183 years of existence on the cutting edge, on the cusp of education, a liberal arts education that is unparalleled. Have a wonderful day, take good care and be healthy.